Hi everyone, welcome to Innovating for Good Google Hangout. I'm Katie Drew, the Emergency Lab Manager with UNHCR Innovation. Innovating for Good is a monthly Google Hangout series hosted by UNHCR Innovation and Plus Social Good that's meant to spark conversations on innovation in the humanitarian sector. Each month we broadcast topics on Innovating for Good and each Hangout carries its own topics. On this third Hangout for 2016, we are bringing together a dream team of panelists. I would like to welcome Gail Nozel from Nini Productions. Gail founded Nini Productions, a media, creative arts, and filmmaking company focused on bringing forward the complex lives and stories of underrepresented people and issues in our world today. We also have Kristen Timerson from FilmAid. Kristen is the Director of Global Partnerships of FilmAid International, an organization that uses the power of film and media to bring life-saving information, psycho psychological relief, and much-needed hope to refugee and other vulnerable communities around Mahudadin, Mahudadin, sorry, who is currently Manager of Partnerships and Director of Storytelling Innovation for Ashoka's Youth Venture and the founder of Me, We, Syria, which currently operates in Jordan's Zatari refugee camp in Turkey. Oh, and in Turkey. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to our three panelists. Um, and today, we will speak about creative arts and how we can transform the life of refugees and why art, storytelling, and self-expression are important in humanitarian response. But before we jump into the conversation, if you're following the Hangout online, please make sure you use the hashtag innov for good So that's innov 4 with the number 4, good, on Twitter. And to tweet our panelists with your questions. So we welcome your questions. We will answer them at the latter part of the conversation. Um, so let's get right to it with our panelists. And I'll start with a critical question that's for all of you. So um, some might say that culture, art, creative capacity, um, particularly in humanitarian uh, crisis is simply not a priority. But what message would you want to bring about its significance? You know, why, why is it important in humanitarian settings? Um, so Kristen, perhaps we could start with you for, for your answer on this one. Sure, no problem. Um, thank you, Katie, and thank you so much for having us here. Um, at FilmAid, uh, in particular for this question, what we really believe is that access to information is critical in a humanitarian setting. Um, when information is stayed, boring, or inaccurate, um, this is dangerous. Um, it means that people don't know where they can get their water, where they can get their food, um, and things like that. Uh, you know, I think every NGO worker can give you an example of when the project was good, the services available were good, but the access to the information and the communications about those services just wasn't there. Um, so if there was a workshop going on, um, you know, people wouldn't know uh, whether or not to show up. Um, they wouldn't know that it existed. Um, and I think that, you know, when information is incorrect, when it's too lengthy, when it's boring, um, it makes, uh, it can lead to really severe and dire consequences in humanitarian settings, whether it's in a refugee camp or whether it is um, in a protracted crisis or whether it's in a conflict setting. Um, so for us at FilmAid, we place the importance of communications, um, which for us is just another word of storytelling. Um, we place a lot of importance on that. Um, and for us, telling a story and being able to involve communities in that um, leads directly to creativity, which engages people um, and makes them interested in that communication process. And so for us, creating art is storytelling, and storytelling is communications. And all of these are absolutely necessary for a fully holistic and comprehensive um, communications package that is necessary in the humanitarian sphere. So, so for us, that's, um, that's really the way that we see it, is that the arts um, is necessary in terms of communications and in terms of what people need in their lives. Um, Gail, did you have anything to add um, about the importance of why we should prioritize creative arts and self-expression um, in humanitarian response? I do. Thank you so much for inviting me to this conversation. It's very inspiring. I think that um, 
everyone, whether they live in Boulder, Colorado, where I'm at, or Washington, D.C., or in Uganda, or Syria, has this amazing, magical part of our system, our humanity, the part of our brain that is imagination, that is metaphor, that is symbolism, that we all, as human beings, have this creative language, and that creative languaging can help us to solve problems, it can help us to understand one another, it can help us to blur the lines between what we think think we understand, but what we don't yet know. So I think that creativity and art needs to be in the forefront of how we meet people, how we solve problems, how we innovate from um, new places, from the bottom up, so to speak. I think that um, we can use that. Creativity is like a universal language and that we can use it to um, make a difference in the world. And it's just a matter of finding the techniques, finding the time, finding the um, sort of creative space to unlock those similarities. I think creativity is a universal language, yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, Gail. So um, picking up on that point about sort of finding that language, finding that creative space, um, Martin, maybe you could speak a little bit to how innovators and advocates can help organizations find the value and, and to promote um, creativity in this space. Um, so any of your experience that you have around sort of finding the importance of, of creativity? Yeah, I think um, one of the things we have to do for those of us working in this space is, is find a better language first. Uh, otherwise, we're preaching to the choir. Um, and I'm sure other great panelists on this have met the same tensions, but when you're in a stressful you know, humanitarian setting or when you're dealing with NGOs or companies, uh, the term creativity and storytelling immediately turns some people off because they don't really understand what's behind that word. So I think you know, a first step is to actually uh, communicate that storytelling and communications is inherently tied to community building, right? If you look at the word communications um, and community, uh, there, there's a Vietnamese Buddhist that said they, they share the same root. These things are inherently tied together. Um, so if we're in a humanitarian uh, crisis situation um, and there's only technical programs that are absent of social and emotional learning, um, which are critical ingredients for sustainable peace and development, um, none of the, those programs are going to last and they're not going to work and they're not going to be internalized and localized by the populations that they're meant to empower and to serve. Um, so, you know, for, for us at Youth Venture, you know, the, the MIWI Syria program is actually uh, a critical vehicle for um, giving exercise to these concepts that are crucial for sustainable peace and development. And by, by those ingredients, I mean empathy, cognitive empathy, um, fluid leadership, building a team of teams culture, um, creating spaces and opportunities for social inclusion and integration and cultural dialogue. Storytelling and communications is the vehicle to achieve all those things. It has a cascading effect on all those crucial ingredients for sustainable peace and development. So when, when messaging this, I'm constantly trying to challenge myself to, to not preach to the choir in terms of the words creativity and, and storytelling because I, I find that a lot of people are turned off by that. Um, we have to look behind those words. So, for example, when we talk about education, every politician talks about education for all. Yeah, that sounds great, but people become desensitized to it. And storytelling is something that every human being is programmed with. It lives inside of us. Sometimes, For some of us, it's not activated, but it lives inside of us, right? We just don't know it yet. And we have to tap into that. We have to go beyond the word. So in education, what we're really talking about is well-being. We're talking about happiness, mental health, uh, gender equality. We're talking about all these things that are critical for, for humanity and survival, right? So I think when we talk about communications and storytelling, we should not be so uh, apologetic in connecting it to those things. So for me, uh, storytelling and communications, and for the MeWe Syria program, it's vital for, for uh, a thriving humanity, not a humanity that just survives and gets by, but one that thrives. And one where human-to-human -human contact and communication uh, is building, is advancing people and planet. And I think we have to be, it, it, for me, when we say storytelling, to me it's a matter of security, it's a matter of well-being, and it's a matter of survival. Great, that was that was really, really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, 
I'm very interested in how all of them for our projects, who are, we, who are we aiming to reach, who are we aiming to engage, we were talking about that sort of social cohesion, that community element. Um, so Kristen, coming back to you, how do you support people to um, identify who will be listening, who will be watching, and how do you really make sure that your, the work that you're, you're producing is really engaging and is accessible to, to that audience? Absolutely. Um, so I can talk a little bit about um, you know, I think audience is the most is one of the most important pieces of communications and storytelling. You need to know your audience, and you need to know who you're talking with, um, and what you want to say to them, and what you want the end goal to be, um, or the end goals. Um, in particular, um, you know, I can give you an example. Um, but generally, we use uh, distribution networks that are already existing, um, such as you know, a radio station that already exists in the area, um, you know, uh, WhatsApp groups that already exist, journalism groups that already exist, things like that. And then we also create our own distribution networks too and publicize them and promote them within the community. And we do all of this um, in conjunction with community members. So we talk with community leadership as well as with, um, as well as with people who are not that normally don't have a voice, um, those vulnerable populations, um, including women, girls, um, disabled persons, the elderly, um, about what communication networks are the best for them. Um, and so, you know, if we want to talk about, um, if we want to focus on uh, talking about the importance of girls' education with parents and guardians, um, you know, we know that SMS may not be the right way to go for that. Um, that's usually a better way to target youth in particular. So if we're looking at parents and guardians, you know, we may want to do a mobile cinema screening series. We may want to do radio dramas that focus on them um, and focus on a character in a drama that is related to what they're experiencing and the difficult issues that they have when they're thinking about whether or not to send their girl, girl to school. Um, and so for us, it's really thinking through those those audience members and their communication networks. So we do kind of a full um, needs assessment um, before um, you know once a year, as well as a needs assessment for every particular project that we're doing. Um, and we also all of our cast and crew are people that are trained by Film Aid. Um, you know, such as refugees, such as other vulnerable populations that we're working with. Um, and so it means that, you know, when we have a radio drama that is done um, about girls' education, um, it's done in a local language, like in Kenya, for example, um, there's t uh, about 500,000 refugees, over 500,000 refugees from multiple multiple areas and we'll do radio dramas in Dinka that are specifically for you know parents and guardians that are from the Dinka communities from South Sudan in this one particular area of the refugee camp and it's directed towards them and will include cast and crew that are neighbors um, and are friends of them um, so that it's something that is really community based and has that buy-in from the very start. Um, so that's kind of how we how we focus on our audience is, is they're they're included from the very first step to the very end of any project that we do. Great, thank you, Gail. Could you speak a little bit to how you make sure that the uh, the product that you're producing, the work that you're working on, is as engaging as possible for the audience that you're directing it towards? Yeah, I can. You know, I'm working at a much smaller scale than. Um, Film Aid, and uh, I've been working for the past four years with a group of uh, 30 young women. Um, majority of them are refugees living in uh, western Uganda, and the audience has primarily been themselves. They're creating content that they're directing, that, that is um, of interest to them. And then the second audience at this point is their community, their families, their parents. And so we, um, our process has been that the, their um, filmmaking, their creative arts, their poetry, their storytelling, their drawings come, first of all, um, based on what they want to know. 
and what they're interested in expressing. And then they take that material back to their families every, maybe two or three times a year and they make I would guess you could call them like presentations to their family. They translate, they describe to their family what they were doing, what the story's about. And um, the audience then for them is just the direct community. It's not out really, really large. It's not like on a big screen for all of the refugee settlement, but the word is spreading. The families love when the girls come back and make their um, presentations. They get to see them in action. They get to see the girls describe how to use the camera, how to put the camera on the tripod. They describe what the purpose of the drawing was for. For example, if they were expressing their notions of home, they, they get to express that creatively to their families. They speak in whatever language it is that their family needs to hear them in. And so that's how I that's how I've been working with audience. It's becoming more of a bottom-up, organic process, working just with a small group of young women now and meeting their needs. They create the product. They take it back to their community. They are in charge of presenting it to their community. That's how my program's been working, and it's wonderful. I love it. It keeps going out bigger and bigger and bigger. Neighbors come over. You know, more and more people want to show up when the girls come to town. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Thank you for that contribution. Um, Martin, I wonder whether you'd be able to talk to us about Me We Syria now. Um, why did you start the project? What was the idea behind it? It would be great to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, for, it's really inspiring and, and amazing to hear uh, from Kristen and Gail, by the way. So, just super fantastic. And uh, we have to combine forces. Uh, as a team of teams, I think we could do so much. I have so much to learn from you guys, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, in terms of MiWi Syria, it actually started uh, as a very small project in Morocco. So it actually had nothing to do with Syria. This was over six years ago. So the, the program was involving uh, communications and music and the arts, uh, but activating, activating young uh, street children in Morocco to be change makers through the lens of communications and, and artistic expression. Um, so we worked with over 300 street children and migrants, young street children and migrants in Morocco. Uh, and I actually saw that there was something to this. Um, this was more than six years ago. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and I actually co-created the, the idea of the program with, with, the, with the young street children, with these young kids. Um, so that process of co-creation I immediately saw is, is something that should always be built into how I would run or evolve this program. Um, and from there, the program expanded to Kashmir at an orphanage there. Again, it was tailored and co-created with those young orphans in Kashmir. Uh, and I kept seeing the transformational uh, impact that was taking place for these young kids. Um, we're living in a world right now where our youth, and our particularly youth in, in sensitive socioeconomic and security situations, are just being taught to memorize and to repeat. Memorize, repeat, memorize, repeat. Uh, there's no experiential journey for them to give themselves permission to disrupt the world around them for the better. Um, so I kept seeing this uh, with the young kids I was working with. Uh, and when I came to Ashoka's Youth Venture, there was an opportunity to really globalize the program. Uh, and looking at what was happening in Syria, uh, you could see that Really, what's at stake if we don't uh, really push the lens of you know, creative enterprise and storytelling in our youth engagement work with especially young refugees and Syrians? I could see the risk. What's at stake, the so what factor, is that you will have a generation of young people who could move, could move further down isolation, alienation, extremism. Uh, and, you know, if the world is failing the people of Syria on a daily basis, should that necessarily mean that our young people should memorize and repeat that formula and then also they will continue the cycle? No. And in fact, uh, when I started piloting this idea in Zatari Refugee Camp, it was very clear that through the lens of creativity and storytelling, there was an entry point to ensure that even though the world is failing Syrian people on a daily basis, the youth of Syria will not fail our world. And to ensure and keep that sustainable and keep that running, 
uh, it's essential that they are part of the process of developing these creative programs, especially in different cultural and, and you know security contexts. Um, so I can't say that uh, the program is mine. Actually, it's actually everybody's that's involved in it. Uh, to me, it's so crucial to have that component, and I think that speaks to your audience question too. By the way, um, throughout the Me We Syria program, for instance, uh, at, you know, with Ashoka's youth venture, the 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 first entire part of the process has nothing to do with cameras. It has nothing to do with technology or equipment. Uh, it has nothing to do with these terms that are weird for people in certain places, like storytelling or communications. Um, it actually focuses entirely on giving, giving an opportunity for the beneficiaries, for the refugees, to step into their story. And in order to do that, in order to step into their story, they need to be given opportunities for internal disruption uh, before they get to that next level of connecting you know, their mind and their heart and their breath and their stories to the outside world. There has to be a self-permission and an erosion of those internal barriers that the world is kind of imposing upon them to be isolated to hold things in. So the entire first part of the program, I kept seeing over the years that I was doing it, is so crucial to get to that second level of actually where they, these young refugees are now writing, directing, producing their own short films on change making and change maker ideas uh, and things that they want to change in the world and things around them. Um, that's an output, right? But I think uh, what my what I really really passionate about and what keeps me doing the program is it's entirely process driven. The process is where all the richness and the nutrients are for this arts and creativity type of approach to to empowering youth. Um, and as they're developing their stories, uh, they are the ones that are choosing their target audience. So they go through an, a process where they really think critically about who is my target audience as a young Syrian from Homs. What is the reaction that I can imagine in my mind that I want that person to have when they see my story, they hear my story? And one of the things we push in the program is that effective storytelling does not have an ending. And especially when we're talking about storytelling for social change, it should not have an ending. It's something that when I see it or I'm exposed to it, I as an audience member become pushed to be an active participant in that movement for social change. Even if it's tiny, if it's just changing some small behavioral you know, thing that I'm used to doing, for instance, climate change, changing my light bulbs. I mean, something that tiny to something big, like mobilizing my community to actually screen some of these Syrian refugee stories, um, which is also, by the way, something that I think is really impactful too. So with, with this program, we're doing internal community gatherings where the youth that are writing, producing, and directing their own short stories on, on, uh, on change, we're screening them inside the refugee camp but also screening them at local art galleries and spaces within the host country where these refugees are so that the community can be invited and be given an opportunity for, for understanding and, and, and seeing a different narrative, a narrative that's not dominated by ISIS or failed politics. The second thing we're doing is, is we're making sure that internationally it's exposed. So we're showing them at different film events uh, and art, ex art exhibits and, and international media. Al Jazeera America, for instance, Huffington Post are starting to actually promote these stories that are youth-led, youth-led stories from the Syrians themselves. Um, that aspect of it is what keeps me super excited about the whole thing. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And um, Gail, it'd be great to hear from you. If I was to play devil's advocate and say, well, I don't think that creative arts can uh, can change a community, can change, can create change, um, what would be your response to that? Oh, you don't think that the creative arts can change communities. And I would say that you can take a young woman that I like I've been working with and she can start off and be in senior one you know first year of high school very very shy um, keeps her head down all the time doesn't want to necessarily talk about her life or her story and then over the course of a year or so working with a camera whether it's with her friend in their room drawing pictures, writing poetry, then she goes back and she makes a presentation. Her posture is different. She looks men and her father and her community members in the face and she starts to tell a story of what her education has been like. She starts to talk about why it was important for her to be able to go to school and to have food all the time and to have um, health access to health 
care and go to a hospital. So she becomes an advocate and a and sort of a storyteller about how her confidence grew, what she learned. She talks about the subjects she's taking at school. She talks about um, macroeconomics. You know, she starts to show herself and present herself as an empowered young woman. And I think that's very informative for all the other young girls that are there at the camp listening to her, to the father who's listening to her and saying, oh, maybe you should go back and finish the next year of school. And yes, I will give your um, community, you know, a sack of maize. And then it becomes mutual, it becomes collaborative. And there are some boundaries that are crossed there, both tangibly and untangibly, directly and indirectly. There's the community that's learning about um, what happened to this one young woman, Beatrice, and how she has grown in one year. They see the way she carries herself. They hear the information she speaks. And then there is the understanding by the father and the brother that it's okay that the girl is gone for a year, that the girl is not necessarily in um, a place to get married. So it has some, some real... Um, I want to say system-based, um, you know, results that are demonstrated through the girl herself in this program. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question coming through from um, from Twitter. So I thought I'd open the floor and to see who wants to answer this. So this is coming from um, Kamia, who says. Um, you know, create. Well, the question was around. Um, it's great for refugees to have the opportunity to be advocates on a global stage. This is a fantastic opportunity for them. But this seems small compared to some of the legal and policy restrictions that they're currently facing. Um, who, who would like to answer that or respond to that question coming through from from Cameo on on, on Twitter? Could you repeat that yeah, one more time? Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So um, it was a comment, but it was um, more around sort of it's great, it's fantastic that there's an opportunity that people, that refugees have the opportunity to um, become advocates and have a voice on the global stage through um, through creative arts. Um, but the comment was this seems small compared to the challenges, some of the challenges that they're currently facing. Um, and specifically the legal um, restrictions currently faced by refugees. Um, Kristen, I think you had your hand up um, if you wanted to, to have a have a answer to this one. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think personally, um, and then also from Film Aid's side, um, those are the voices that are the most important in these discussions, um, are the voices of the refugees themselves. Um, and I think being able to empower those voices is incredibly important. Um, you know, what we were talking about with um, self-expression, what Gail was saying about the importance of self-expression in that one girl's life. Um, it's so important because being able to be listened to and to be heard is something that is incredibly powerful. Um, and especially for someone who is in such a vulnerable situation um, that being able to be listened and be heard, you know, even if it's about these legal discussions, even if it's about these policy issues, um, you know, that voice needs to be at the table. Um, and and there's different ways we can do that. Different, you know, it, it is difficult for refugees to travel, that sort of thing. Um, however, just like here with Google Hangouts, there are other ways of communicating um, that are powerful and impactful and um, you know, necessary for that conversation. Um, and and on top of that, not only do, you know, not only do the people that we're talking about need to have a seat at the table, um, but they also need to be um, accurately informed about um, all of their legal and protection rights. And I think that's something that um, that depending on where we're talking about, we do to an extent. Um, you know, I know that that you know, Film Aid. We're about to um, you know move into Jordan soon to work with Syrian refugees. Excited to possibly work with Mossadin as well, um, and and you know that sort of thing. Um, and I know that in East Africa we have our kind of you know 
information about registration, about legal issues, about protection issues. Um, same with Thailand as well, where we work there. Um, and that's something that also is really important to do um, and, and something that I think uh, doesn't get talked about enough. Great, thank you. Um, I wonder whether we could come and have a look at the, the challenges that some of you have been facing in maybe your current projects or previous work. I would like to talk through some of the ways that you've looked to address the challenges faced at field level in terms of uh, creative arts projects um, and potentially sort of recommendations or solutions coming from them. Um, so Marcin, maybe we could start with, with you on this one, please. Uh, yeah, where do I begin? Uh, there's challenges every week, <laughs> um, especially when you're considering um, the, the communities that we're working with. Um, but it, it really depends on the location. So, um, for example, in Jordan, where Ashoka's Youth Venture and Miwi Syria is working, uh, we, we've been working for several years uh, in the refugee camp, in Zatari refugee camp. That's a very unstable place and environment. Um, Things are changing there on a daily basis, not just technically and service-wise, but emotionally, uh, well-being-wise, mental health-wise. Um, being able to keep up with that unpredictability is very, very difficult, um, which is why it's crucial to, as much as you can, uh, for others that are trying to do similar work or maybe have something to teach me because I always have things to learn but one of the things I learned is is moving away from the direct service approach so for example as the founder of the program I can't be I can't have my ear to the ground to and be quickly responsive to the needs of of what's going on in Zatari it's only when I'm actually there which I go several times a year to keep the program moving which is why building in a component where you move away from direct service towards scaling up where you have a training of trainers model or a replicator model that involves the replicators being the older uh, Syrians themselves who got it, who really believe in it, who want to localize it and you give them the keys to the vehicle and let them run it. Um, th that way they can be more responsive to what's happening on the ground and it's not tied to what's going on in Washington DC which is nothing goes on in Washington DC, it's a very boring place. <laughs> But in general, uh, having that replication model is extremely important. Um, you know, the other challenge I would say, um, and is is the cultural uh, and familial barriers that can take place. Um, the lens of creativity and self-expression and storytelling involves communication. It involves being comfortable with being uncomfortable, and when you're working with population especially you know I'm Muslim for example right so I you know I've seen all sides of different Muslim communities there's some that are very liberal and some that are very conservative but if you're working with a group of young girls who have never held a camera before and they're coming from a conservative part of Syria where they wear gloves for instance they don't even show right I mean they, they won't shake your hand or anything uh, their family members in that community is going to obviously and understandably be a bit uncomfortable with them engaging in that type of program so one of the challenges that, that uh, I've always encountered is, is how do you keep the, the project sustainable in a, in a cultural context like that where there's cultural barriers taking place and one interesting quick anecdote would be you know there was one time where I was working in Zatari refugee camp and I was working with a group of 15 young Syrian girls and my replicator was herself an older Syrian woman who was fantastic and she's managing the program now in, in, with Questscope NGO inside Zatari Refugee Camp. And we made great progress. The girls were writing, producing, directing their own short stories, they were expressing themselves, they were being motivated, they were thinking about community challenges. And one day I walked into the camp to run the next training and they were all extremely angry and upset and disengaged. And I had a room, just all this energy coming at me and I was like, what is going on? And it came down to they were literally being made fun of and also discouraged by their family members from engaging in the process to begin with. Now there's two things you can do. You can accept that and run away from it or you can embrace that friction, harness that friction as the energy you need to just take a sledgehammer and start breaking walls instead of walking around them. 
So we use that as an opportunity to actually have a debate about how uh, creative expression, knowledge sharing, and communication is inherently tied to the culture and even from a religious standpoint, since I am coming from a Muslim myself, I was able to push back and show the diversity within the religious space of, of what being a Muslim can mean, even though the project is not meant to be have any religious or political connotation, but this was an instance where it had to be engaged, otherwise the project would have totally been null. Uh, and then that turned into a debate about, well, all of our characters, the girls were saying, all of our characters are males. We can't make them girls. Girls can't drive a car, they can't live on their own, they can't just go off to a university as if it's just that easy for them. That's where they were coming from, right? Some of these girls. So we ended up having a debate. We used that friction and that tension to have an open debate where diverse viewpoints were expressed and stories were shared about that certainly, that's certainly a reality for some, but that's not the reality for the world. A week later, those girls then changed they changed their narratives to have female-driven characters in the short films that they were producing. And to me, that was a transformational moment, right? Um, where a challenge, a challenge isn't a challenge, it's an opportunity. And had I, I, I definitely was freaked out and wanted to run away from that whole challenge to begin with. But by engaging that challenge and using that energy to just break walls instead of running away from it, that was a really positive moment, right? So I think not being afraid to, to push back on some of those cultural... Uh, or religious kind of barriers that might exist when, when you're trying to engage and do this work with certain communities. I think it's really important. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. We've got quite a few questions coming through on um, Twitter at the moment. So um, it would be great, uh, Gail, if you could share some of your quick challenges with us and um, and then we'll go quickly to Kristen and then start to address the, the Twitter questions coming through. Sure. Uh, you know, I really liked what I heard from Motion about, you know, how he um, adapted to the challenges because conversation is great and ha having the challenges just aired and just talk about them is a form of communication, it's a form of modeling, how to creatively, um, you know, get through barriers, I, I think that's a really great approach and I've used that before. In the, the group that I'm working with, it's a protracted um, refugee situation. So these are um, people who have been living for decades um, as refugees in a settlement and there are still some of the same challenges that exist there after 20 years that you know exist today in new refugee situations and um, it's it's still a challenge to find some basic infrastructure support like electricity you know as the the people that I work with get more and more interested in the power of filmmaking then of course the momentum builds the pace builds they want to do more they want to work with the cameras more they want to spend more time which is lovely but then the infrastructure isn't always there to support it it's very hard to charge cameras in this refugee settlement and um, so my hope is that I can find ways to keep up with the creative momentum that's growing every time this community gets um, the experience of working with film, working with art, you know, working with um, communications and uh, so it's, it's infrastructure. I wish that there were cameras out there that you know could easily be powered with solar or that there were um, you know, companies that said, oh, here's some cameras that need to be, you know, just upcycled a little bit and you can have them all, you know, <laughs> just that kind of, that kind of challenge would be, um, I think, uh, something I'd like to, to solve. Kristen, do you have a challenge to add to the mix? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just very, very quickly. Um, one challenge, I think, in particular is uh, donor priori prioritization. Um, and, and, you know, I think that finally donors are seeing that communications is necessary um, for attitude and behavior change. Um, but the problem is, is that um, creative arts aren't, and storytelling it still isn't seen that way um, as, as promoting attitude and behavior change. Even though what we've talked about in this Google Hangout is that these are transformative experiences that change people's lives. And that's what art does, is art does change, you know, people's attitudes and behaviors. Um, but, but I know that that argument um, is, it still has to be couched in that, in those terms of communications, um, because, um, 
just as Mosin was saying earlier, saying arts, saying storytelling, saying creativity, um, turns people's brains off um, when it comes to money sometimes. Um, or, or it turns their brains onto, oh, you want um, $2,000 instead of $2 million. Um, so, so it's that's the that's the reality, and that's that's a challenge that I think all of us have. Okay, so as we go to the um, the questions that we have coming through on Twitter now, we're going to go through to one coming through from Mi Walsa. Sorry, um, uh, that's uh, her name's Mijam, Mijam, and it says, "What about creative business in refugee camps? How do we support startup ideas by refugees in the creative sector?" Um, does anyone would anyone like to have a sort of short response to that that question coming through? Yeah, Kristen, if you're sure, um, I'm happy to. I that's that's for Filmate. That's one of the biggest things that we do is creative entrepreneurship. Um, you know, one of our um, uh, one of our projects right now is UNHCR funded. Um, it's it's in that blog post that. Um, is also linked on the on the Google Hangout invite. Um, uh, and Artists for Refugees is that project, and that's based in Kenya, um, working with refugees. And in particular, it's you know what we're really excited about is that you know basically Kenyan artists could do workshops, whether virtual or in person, with refugee artists, and so it ties together those populations in a really interesting way. Um, but then a lot of those refugees were able to come to Nairobi, um, sell some of their artwork, uh, talk to, you know, make those partnership connections, um, be able to invest some of the money that they earned into more art equipment for themselves. Um, you know, I think, I think that's something that, you know, at least from our trainings, we've seen um, you know, people who do film and journalism and other creative arts trainings, um, they learn a whole host of skills. They learn budgeting, they learn writing, they learn um, communication skills, um, they learn leadership, teamwork, etc. And so for us, that's, you know, we've had people who are now, um, you know, at film schools, but they're also in, um, you know, working in administrative jobs. They're also, um, you know, going to school for other things as well. They're they're doing a whole host of things. Um, and for us, that's what the really exciting part is that it's it's you know it's about communications and entrepreneurship and giving people the chance to you know have a livelihood. Great, thanks for that. Um, and we're just going to move to the uh, next question, which I might direct towards Martin. Um, how can the tech community partner with us to, to help magnify the impact of our projects? Um, and that was coming through from uh, Alex Tikas on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs> I actually know who that is. Uh, <laughs> he's a friend of mine. Um, so how can the tech community support? Um, I think there are several ways. Uh, one, uh, there's a general need for uh, simple-to-use equipment uh, that can be donated and put, and, and the agency of who controls that equipment, how it's used, is put in the hands of the beneficiaries, the refugees themselves. Um, one of the, the, the things that keeps coming up is, can there be more, uh, for example, let's think crazy for a minute. Uh, if you could get thousands of, of smartphones donated to... Uh, certain refugee communities that are programmed with certain software or apps that are in Arabic, uh, translated to Arabic, that could just be used and distributed so that if you're really decentralizing the power of narrative and who is able to create content, um, if you could do something like that. Um, having organizations like Twitter or Facebook um, for pro bono run uh, ad campaigns and sponsored campaigns that are promoting these youth-led refugee narratives that are produced and written by the refugees themselves I think would be something very huge. Um, one idea that I think would be amazing for Twitter and Facebook to use would be to uh, create uh, an application where for social inclusion where I as a Facebook or Twitter user in the United States would uh, volunteer and once a month I could engage in a picture sharing or storytelling sharing kind of dialogue with a Syrian young person, 
most of my students had phones and they were using Facebook uh, and WhatsApp and all these things already. Uh, and you're really building uh, a self-multiplying conversation if it's led by those tech companies where they're creating an opportunity for global users to step into. And as, as I, as a Facebook user in the United States, if I volunteer and I say once a month I'm going to share a picture or I'm going to share a question with, uh, I'm going to be randomly paired by Facebook to a Syrian, uh, and then we're going to be kind of given this opportunity to have a dialogue, and it's just it's easy for me to do, and it's set up, and I can do it on my phone. That would be pretty incredible, wouldn't it? Um, that would be, you know, a global conversation that is also creating spaces for social inclusion and cultural dialogue. So I, I think Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp, and all these companies should think along those lines. And how can we, as small smaller shops, uh, get our ex our already activated communities of young Syrians or refugees, wherever they may be, to take part in such a campaign or such an opportunity? And then global NGOs can encourage, and Facebook can encourage their existing users in Europe or in, in the States or in Canada or wherever to take part in it as well. So there's a two-way communication happening, but it's happening on these platforms that already exist and that are used. NGOs are constantly talking about platforms and creating something new. It's ridiculous. Like NGOs don't know how to create platforms. Um, these platforms are built by people that know how to do it and they're focused on it. So I think Alex brings up a very important point is you know, there needs to be a way to, to use the technology to actually build a two-way communication between these alienated, isolated communities and those of us that use Facebook every day, whether I'm in D.C. or Toronto or wherever. Great, thank you. And I think that that really links nicely to a question that we had um, coming through from Vicky Ramirez, um, 91, who says, as a former undocumented immigrant herself, she said she felt like a half-human. How can we really connect refugees with those that empower? Um, and Gail, if I could ask you to, to respond to that question, please. Sorry. Press the wrong button. Uh, how can we connect the? Can you say the question again? Yeah, certainly. Hello? It was how can we connect? Yeah, how can we connect um, refugees um, to those people who 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 empower? She says it's it's around sort of the fact that she felt like a half human herself when she was an mm. undocumented immigrant. So how mm. can we really make sure that we're connecting refugees with with the right people, and, and I think Mohsin was touching on it with the sort of Facebook and the platforms earlier, but from your experience, how can we improve okay. connectedness? So when I was just in, um, in Uganda a month ago, I uh, purchased, you can purchase these um, portable modems. It's, it's a flash drive um, type uploaded, you know, internet modem. There's no internet in the area where I work in rural Uganda. But with my laptop and that modem that I purchased, I was able to do a Skype call with the girls, a group of the girls, and um, some colleagues here in Denver who work for the United Nations Association. And so there were three women in Colorado, in Denver, early in the morning, Skyping with six young girls, young women, in um, in Uganda and it just came alive and one of the young girls filmed it while it was happening too so there was this kind of film within a film thing and these these women these professionals in the United Nations Association Denver chapter were sharing their background the girls were asking questions oh you know I want to be an engineer what do you know about engineering I want to be a social entrepreneur what do you know about social entrepreneurship I want to be a journalist they were having this lively conversation that came through the medium of internet, you know, on a stick, and came live, and uh, and they just were so inspired. So they started a conversation. And that's just one example of how they were starting a conversation between cultures across time, across time zones, and that conversation is going to continue. They want to they want to continue to have like a mentorship conversation, learn about one another through this um, internet stick. There is no you know, Wi-Fi available in this area, but you can you can buy a little stick and plug it into a computer. So, just a few little um, you know pieces of equipment can help. 
Great. Well, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for their contribution today. It's been great hearing from you, and um, also to all the viewers and everyone who's been engaged on Twitter. We've had some great questions and some real engagement coming through. Um, if you want to continue having a conversation online, you can definitely um, uh, continue the discussion. Um, please do. Um, just so you know, for the next time we have a Hangout, we're hoping to be broadcasting live from the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul. Um, so that's definitely an opportunity for you to sort of continue talking about the field of innovation with us. Um, if you would like to um, follow this conversation again, um, it will also be available online on our YouTube channels, plus, which is our Plus Social Good, and the UNHCR Innovation YouTube channel as well. And we do encourage you to um, continue the discussion online through Twitter. So from myself, um, it was great to speak to you all. Um, thank you for your time this morning. And thanks very much for everyone who's listening online. Thanks, everybody.